This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Unstoppable. And today's guest, we have John Levy. Now, this guy is a behavioral scientist where his work for influence and human connection and decision-making has been taught all over the world. In fact, he's got a book coming out very shortly called You're Invited, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence, which is set to be released in the coming May 2021. This gentleman has done the most incredible things. I've been reading through here some of the things that you've done, John. And I have to say, even just in the conversation we had prior, you're like, mate, listen, I just ran back from... Th- physical therapy because I got crushed by a bull uh, you know, a couple of years ago. So I, I feel like this is going to be an absolute corker of an interview. But before we jump into this, mate, something I like to ask all of my guests and considering what you do, and for those people who don't know, you um, you run the, the Influencers Dinner, which is a private community and dining experience. It was founded over a decade ago and you've had over 160 dinners with over 1,500 guests, influencers, and it's received considerable media coverage, which I should point out, the New York Times, Forbes, Business Insiders, uh, with thousands of members and influencers influences from the largest community of its type worldwide, which is kind of really interesting because when I have guests that come on the show, John, I always ask them this question. If you were at a dinner party and you were mm-hmm. sitting down with seven other people who didn't know who you were, and then all of a sudden the conversation runs dry and attention goes to you and someone beside you says, with everyone paying attention, so John, what is it that you do? How do you answer that question? Um, so there's the kind of like joke answer that I give, which is I spend most of my life convincing people to cook me dinner Uh, (laughs) and and people are like, what are you talking about? That's such a strange thing. Uh, and so I don't know how much you want us to just like dive right into it, but I'm happy to, uh, so what I, I explained is that I'm a behavioral scientist, but my specialty is around human connection trust and the way we connect. I spent many, many years looking at the science of adventure. So I traveled around the world getting myself in trouble, uh, doing the stupid things that nobody should really do, like swimming for as long as possible in Antarctic waters that are zero degrees uh, to see like, oh, you know, when, when will I actually get in trouble or something like that? Uh, or I went to running of the bulls in Pamplona. I got crushed by a bull and almost died. I battled the actor Kiefer Sutherland in Drunken Jenga and uh, <laughs> won an invitation to his family Thanksgiving. But he was so drunk, he forgot he invited me. So when I showed up with my family, he looked at me like, who are you and what are you doing in, in here? Like, uh, one of the crazier things I did was I was traveling from Stockholm to Israel to meet up with my family. I was with my best friend. We were in duty free. And as we were going through duty free, uh, the woman behind the counter when we were checking out asked for our, our tickets to make sure that we were leaving the European Union. And when she looked at it, she said, oh, Israel. And I said, yeah, do you want to come? And she said, <laughs> yes. So a half hour later, we booked her ticket. She quit her job and she decided to travel with us. No and shit. So and you didn't, I, no, no marriages? I, and not from her. Not from her. <laughs> I, the way I met my wife was almost, was, was very similar. I was at JFK Airport, uh, which is the main airport here in New York City, where I live. And... I uh, struck up a conversation with this lovely uh, young lady, and uh, she was just not having it. She was having like one of the worst days of her life. And I managed to like, you know, make her feel like I wasn't a complete jerk. She had been moving that day and had to catch a flight and everything went wrong. And so she was super stressed out. And uh, they called the flight and I said, hey, do you want to cut the line? I have status and I can bring somebody with me. And she's like, will we get in trouble? I'm like, no, no, don't worry about it. You'll just get on the plane earlier. And I'd never said this to anybody, but when we were on the airbridge, that space between the gate and the plane, I said, uh, you know, you really have two options. You can either take your pre-assigned seat and probably sit down next to some 300-pound man, muffin topping <laughs> over the armrest with terrible <laughs> BO, or you can sit next to me and have the most interesting flight of your life. So what do you want to do? And she wow. said, "Wow, okay. And oh, uh, that's how I met my wife. Wow, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you talk about uh, and you your main business is around you know cultivating trust and human connection and influence. And mm-hmm. I've got to say, John, there's this real, and I said this to you obviously in the pre as well. Like you remind you reminded me of someone and I couldn't work out who, and I'm not sure if this is it, but you remind me of my father-in-law Don, who's probably one of the most one of the most my most favorite humans on the planet. 
But even as I talk to you now, what I find really interesting is you have this ability to just generate this instant level of likability. Um, and I interview oh, a you. lot of people. I get exposed to a lot of people. But I'm I'm curious, like with the study and the research that you've done, mm-hmm. ha, you know, has this changed the way that you connect with other people and the way that you, I guess you could say, essentially build trust to form deeper connections? Yeah. So it's it, it's an interesting question, right? It's, there's this, uh, and I discuss this in my new book. You're invited. Uh, we all kind of suffer from what I call the hummingbird problem, which is that. Uh, the human brain decides if we trust somebody in the basically the amount of time it takes a hummingbird to flap its wings once, which is like, you know, uh, a three a thirtieth of a second or something crazy like that, um, which means that uh, if I don't fall into like the characteristics that you already trust, like high cheekbones and a deep voice and all these things that I'm not particularly tall, right? All these things, then we kind of want to understand what is it that will make you want to connect or build trust. And part of the problem is that I at least used to think I understood how these things work. Uh, but as I researched the book, I realized that I kind of had it all wrong. And I'll give you like a fun little example. Uh, a lot of people try to win others over by giving them stuff and being excessively generous and nice. And generosity is great. It's like a very helpful trait to have. Uh, in fact, the research shows it's generally like when done right, incredibly effective. But have you ever been to a party with a gift bag? Mm. Like where they give you like a swag bag? What do you do with it almost every single time? Well, in most cases, it's full of stuff that I don't need or want, so. Exactly, so you toss it or give it to your kids or whatever, right? Yeah, give it away. Yeah. So that means that they spent all that time and effort trying to win you over and money, but it didn't do anything. So if gifting doesn't generally work, there is one exception. But if it generally doesn't work... I think the exception would be the Academy Awards. I've heard their gift bags are pretty darn good. I think they have like Rolexes. Oh, yeah. There's like full crazy gifting suites. Yeah. yeah, But even then... That's like... Yeah. Like, you're probably not going to use all the stuff and, you know, but count me in. If if you want to give me an Oscar (laughs) and a gift bag, I am all in. All over that. Um, So the question is, what does work? And what researchers found was really kind of startling. Uh, We have something called the Ikea effect built into us, which is that we disproportionately- The Ikea as in the the Swedish Swedish furniture furniture store. Yeah, right. Yeah, that drives you crazy because you have to stand in line for hours, you get into an argument with your significant other, then you have to like get home and assemble everything. (laughs) But, But it turns out that all of that effort actually causes you to care more about it and value it more. Mm. And so, it turns out that if you want somebody to care about something, it's not about being nice to them. I mean, that helps too. Like it doesn't, it's much better than being mean or rude, right? Uh, But it turns out that if I can get you to invest effort into our relationship or into a shared activity, then you're going to care more about it Mm. and care more about me. And that's why at the influencers dinner, the secret dining experience that I created, I don't know, like 11 years ago or so, the guests come in, they're not allowed to talk about what they do or give their last name, so there's no status. And then they have to cook dinner together because then they're investing effort into each other and they'll care more about one another. And I, I, for a while, I was really curious why it actually worked. Like, why does this IKEA effect work? And it turns out, and I don't think this will surprise you at all, uh, human beings think that vulnerability Uh, Sorry, that trust precedes vulnerability. Mm. But vulnerability actually precedes trust. Precedes trust. Yeah, I agree. And so the way it works is that if, let's say, I started working at your company, right? And I'm sitting not far from you and you overhear me say, "Um, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to get all this work done. I've just put out a vulnerability signal. Now, if you ignore it or make fun of me, that'll reduce my trust right? But if you then put out your own vulnerability signal saying, John, my first week here, I was totally overwhelmed too. Uh, How can I help you? Once I see that, we've both demonstrated that we can be vulnerable with each other and we can trust one another at a higher level. And so your original question was, has your research taught you anything that you really apply to connecting with people? And the first is that if I really want to build 
meaningful trust with you, I need to find ways to create vulnerability loops. And when people cook together, do an activity together, that naturally happens. That exists based on... But did you say vulnerability loops? Yes. Right. So like I put out a signal, you put yep. out a signal, and we acknowledge, right? And loop that. that. Yeah. Over gotcha. and over and over again, and trust grows over time. Yeah, right. Uh, so if I really want to like, quote unquote, hack trust, like accelerate the process, what I'm going to try to do is figure out what's an appropriate vulnerability signal for me to put out in the first few seconds. So when I got on with you, my immediate thing was, I was like, what am I actually dealing with right now? Let me just tell them what I'm dealing with. Okay, I'm, I'm rushing over here. I'm kind of overwhelmed. I'm going to just throw this out there. I've had a, a bit of a crazy day. I don't know if you know this. I was crushed by a bull and I'm still in physical therapy. So I'm just running in. I'm sorry if like I'm a little flustered. And that was the start of our conversation, but I clearly put out a signal. And then you matched it with wh whatever your response was and you put something out and then suddenly we're starting these loops. And that's, I guess, how one of the ways I apply the research. So where did this all begin for you? Like, you know, being, cause I am like, I'm, I'm not an academic, but I'm someone who considers myself um, very scientific by nature. <clears throat> mm -hmm. My mother was a clairvoyant. My dad was a world leading economist and ta-da, I kind of ended up in the middle. So I'm someone that's very intuitively guided, but I'm also someone that loves facts, data, process, statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and I've studied and observed, you know, the process and applied the process of um, influence, psychology, um, you know, behavioral transformation for a, quite a significant period of time here, which is born from my own journey. But I'm curious, where did your journey begin? How did you get into behavioral science and end up, you know, having incredible dinners, incredible opportunities to have <laughs> influencers and famous people cook you dinner uh, over and over and over again and then have it written about? Uh, so I, I feel like, you know, when you ever read like a comic book or watch those movies, there's always like this origin moment where everything went terribly wrong and the person spends the rest of their life trying to make up for it. Uh, I would say that I fit into that category. Uh, so when I was in eighth grade, I went to a small school. There was, I think, like 16 of us in the class in my grade. And uh, my teacher walks in one day and decides, okay, we're going to reassign the seating chart. Uh, and what we're going to let everybody do is write down the names of two people they want to sit down next to and two people they don't want to sit down next to. And then everybody handed in secretly. And I unfortunately found out that there two things. One was that there was one kid nobody wanted to sit down next to and that I was that kid. And so I was devastated. Like I was totally heartbroken because I knew I was like geeky. I was into comic books. But I, I shared this computers. information with the students. What? Oh, she, no, so no, they, they didn't tell me. I found it oh. out. Oh, you I, found it out, right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my so God, that said, would be like the worst teacher ever. Oh, my ever. Lord. <laughs> like, <what> yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, from that point onward, I kind of got really curious what causes people to make the decisions that they make. Like, why is it that I was deemed uncool versus one of the other kids? And mind you, I was like super geeky, but back in the 80s and 90s, geeky wasn't like it is now. Now you're going to be a dot-com billionaire if you're geeky. Back then, <laughs> you're like relegated to play Dungeons and Dragons by yourself in the basement somewhere. Geeky so, hadn't achieved the cool status that it has today just yet. Yeah, I get yeah it. exactly. Now like everybody knows the Avengers and Spider-Man and all that. Back then, it was like lonely boys who enjoyed their comics. So uh, that's kind of the origin of it. I got really curious about decision-making back then. And then I'd say when I was about 28, I was like the stereotypical example of not living up to my potential, right? I was broke. I was overweight. I was actually in debt because of all of university and everything. Um, what had you studied I, at university? I studied computer science, math, and economics. Yeah, wow. So uh, you were proper nerding out big time. Yeah, uh -huh. right. Yeah. I, I have two of those degrees to this day. I don't know which two. Uh, because I don't think they could analyze three degrees back then. Like, I don't even know yeah. what the, the deal was. Um, but, but I'm, and I'm shocked I graduated because I literally just, was, I'm not the, uh, even though I'm a scientist, I don't really enjoy traditional academics. I, yeah, I get it. I'm the same. Uh, and, uh, and so I would spend, I'd go to like every personal development course I could and, uh, I would read every book and, 
eventually I got really frustrated because I'd wake up as, uh, at like, you know, a normal time beating myself up for not having woken up at 5 a.m. or whatever to go to w work out and trying to like get everything done that I thought I was supposed to be able to do, right? Why wasn't I motivated to wake up early to exercise? Why wasn't I motivated enough to get everything I wanted to work done? And uh, eventually I came across this crazy study by these two guys, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler. And they were curious about the obesity epidemic. They were curious, does obesity spread from person to person like a cold? Or is it a percentage mm -hmm. of the population like Alzheimer's? Meaning you're clearly insanely fit, but would you get, would you gain weight if you hung out with a lot of people who were heavy set? And That's what they an found- That's interesting study. Yeah, this was shocking. What yeah. they found out was crazy. So if you have yeah. a friend who's obese, your chances increase by 45%. Holy your shit. friends who don't know them have a 20% increased chance. Yeah, right. Their friends have a 5% increased chance. So you have an effect wow. three degrees out. And that's true for happiness, marriage and divorce rates, smoking wow. habits, voting yeah. habits. Everything spreads from person to person. Now, to what degree? That probably changes from the habit or the characteristic. But it shouldn't be that surprising because if you go, uh, if you hang out with your friends who are like extreme athletes, you're suddenly working out twice as hard or often. What's and, interesting though is we seem to know this, right? Because we've always, you know, we've heard people say the cliche term, you know, you take the five people that you hang out with, you know, add up all of their incomes, divide it by five, and that'll be your number. Mm -hmm. What is it, it that is essentially the influenza of proximity that mm -hmm. creates this? I guess you could say, because for the most part, it's an unconscious, I would suggest it's an unconscious influence. Is it, a, is, it, is it a social context where people want to, you know, become more socially attractive to one another or socially alike, where they adopt the same behaviors so that they are more socially aligned and less likely to be rejected by uh, that person in that proximity? What is it that creates the influenza that influences that behavior? I think that it's, if, if I were just to guess straight out, it's uh, two factors. One is that what you talk about is fundamentally different than what my friend Liam talks about. He's an artist. Yeah. So when we sit down to have a conversation, I'll talk to him about creativity and I'll talk to you maybe about how to, you know, 10x my company. And so those values that you have and you, those insights that you have now occupy significantly more thinking time in my head. And that will affect my decisions throughout the day. So just one is straight out that. The second I would guess is that you have certain habits and routines, right? So you go to the, how often do you work out? Three times a week, if I'm lucky, two, three times. Okay, so if I say, okay, you're working out three times a week uh, and I wanna hang out with you, then I'll say, great, let's go do it as a workout. If your thing was that you cooked phenomenal meals, maybe we'd hang out while you're cooking and then suddenly I'm developing better cooking skills and I have a better, as we're doing it, I have a better understanding of fat, sugar, salt, like all these, how to combine them, how to add lemon, what, how to prepare certain meals. But that fundamentally then takes up uh, thinking space. And then what we know is, uh, did you ever hear about that like wild cab driver experiment that was done when they scanned cab driver's brains? No. Uh, this is like a really fascinating one. It used to be believed that our brains, once we were adults, were just done. They're caked, like there's not much you can do to affect them. And there's this, uh, the L London map, right, for the city of London is incredibly complex. And if you want to be a, a taxi driver there, oh, you have to yes. memorize the entire the knowledge. map. Yeah. yeah. And so they scanned people's brains before and after, and what they... Uh, studying and becoming taxi drivers. And what they found is that the area having to do with spatial coordination changed dramatically when they had to memorize these maps and understand locations, meaning that we have neuroplasticity. Our brains can evolve and change and grow critical areas as we become more focused on them. Same thing is true for sommeliers. The areas having to do with smell and taste expand because you now have to have greater differentiation so you can taste things that you wouldn't normally notice. Mm. So 
uh, this is a, all a long way of saying that uh, as an expert in your field, you have certain patterns and systems and organizations of thought that let you make decisions. As I spend time with you and converse and I spend time around your values and your habits, some of those will appeal to me and I'll adopt them. Some of them I'll gain unconsciously, but it would be impossible for me not to be affected by it mm -hmm. one way or another. It's almost like there's this electromagnetic resonance effect that in some cases, because one of the things <clears throat> I find really interesting is you can put two people together and they can be affected. And much mm -hmm. like if you get a needle and you put it, you know, there's no polarity in a needle, there's no magnetic properties in a needle, but you go and you, you stack that on top of another magnet and you leave it there for 24 hours, 24 hours later, that needle is now magnetic. It's been polarized yeah. by that environment. And I, I think there's a lot to be said by not just our, the, the, the behaviors and the values and the socializations, but also that, um, I guess you could say esoteric, energetic properties that we don't necessarily mm -hmm. see, but we feel in other people. So you, you, you're you in debt, you're 28, you, you realize that you've got three degrees more than a thermometer, and what <laughs> happens next? Um, so I, I was actually in a seminar, and, which is what inspired me reading the study. The seminar leader said that the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives are the people we surround ourselves and the conversations that we share right. with them. And I was like, okay, let's see if this is true. I'm gonna find the research. And I came across the study because it had gotten a bunch of attention. And I said, maybe I've been getting it all wrong. Maybe if instead of getting mad at myself for not having these skills and not being perfect, maybe I just need to surround myself with people who are really extraordinary at these things. Mm. And it'll naturally become part of my life. Because frankly, making friends sounds a lot more appealing than just trying to build up my willpower and self-control. Now, willpower and self control is even really the, important. To term networking, because most people like hate. Like I know me personally, I'm. A, I'm oh my god, it's the worst. Age. Yeah, networking and, is awful. In yeah. fact, uh, Kerwin, if if I ask you, what's your emotional association to the word? Think about how you feel when you hear the word. I hate it. And like, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd rather you know, um, you know, I'd I'd rather exfoliate with razor blades. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's amazing. It's uh, researchers. Uh, I think it was Francesca Gino, brilliant researcher from Harvard Business School, uh, looked at the unconscious association that we have to the word networking. And it, the association was wanting to wash your hands because you feel dirty. <laughs> yeah. So like, okay. why would any of us want to network? Tell me one point in our evolutionary history where networking was a thing. Like, mm -hmm. imagine we were in groups of, I don't know, 50 to 250 there was no such thing as networking. You only had friends and family and extended social communities. Mm. You didn't need to like go network. It wasn't like a thing. It's not natural to us. What's natural is developing in groups and out groups for sure, mm. uh, or communities. And so, so when you say in groups and out groups, that's an interesting statement. What's an in group versus an out group? Well, let's look at it like this. Um, okay. If, uh, what's the biggest punishment that we can give people aside from like capital punishment, right? So I, you, somebody goes to jail and what's the worst gotcha. thing we can do to them? Social isolation. Yeah. Yeah. For human beings, the fear of social isolation or the experience of social isolation is devastating. It drives people literally crazy, right? Solitary confinement is cruel and awful and should be eliminated. The issue is that we evolved with the understanding that if we're alone, we're probably not going to survive. So we need to be part of a group. And all of our emotions are lined up with that. Being lonely, for example, if, if Kerwin, you want to live a long time, the greatest predictors of your longevity, aside from your genetics, which we currently can't affect, maybe in mm -hmm. 10 years, CRISPR will let you edit something, uh, are like clean air and water to some degree, Exercise and getting your flu shot, like your annual flu shot, are on par with each other. Quitting drinking and quitting smoking are pretty important. But number two is having close friends. And number mm. one is having loose social ties, feeling like you're part of a community. Mm. And here's what's really interesting about that. I don't know how it is where you live, but in the U.S., in 1985, the average American had three close friends besides family. Just about. It was a little bit less. 
by 2004, that was down to just about two. So we lost 50% of our friends in 20 years, 19 wow. years, I guess. And that's before social media even existed. Now, a lot of the problem is that people are moving away from where they grew up more often for work and school, and so they're losing their social ties. But if we think about the fact that the greatest predictor of our longevity is social ties, and then we're intentionally cutting them, mm. then we're in a situation that isn't ideal. And So timely. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, especially because now, you know, some families are saying, oh, we feel closer because we do a family Zoom every week and things like that. But in general, my hunch is that most people feel more isolated and lonely, especially if they're single. And especially with what's been going on, um, you know, the last year and a half with since COVID. But we all like making friends. So I started trying to understand what engages influential people so that we could connect and make friends. But I didn't just want to be friends with them. I didn't want to be like a hub in a, a spoke, like in a wheel, right? Uh, I wanted them to be connected to each other because if I know somebody who's really good at staying fit, right, like a professional athlete, I know somebody who's really good with finance and they meet each other, then they'll positively impact each other mm. and then I'll get that secondary effect. So if that, ath you know, if that Olympian becomes wealthier and I'm friends with them, then I'm getting that secondary effect. Yeah, right. And so I wanted to create a, a, fundamentally a community, a group of people who had close social ties to each other that were friends with each other. And that way, even if I can't stay in touch with all of them all the time, the fact that they're connected to each other keeps them close and so that they're always part of my circle to some degree. And so you've been doing these dinners now for, is that over a decade? Yeah, I think it's 11 years. 11 years. Know. Yeah, 11 years. Well, I, so I, I haven't done a dinner in a year because of COVID. COVID right? yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I'm curious to know, like, what's been the effects on your life? Because you seem to be like the, the ultimate case study for this oh, content. Uh, it's funny. I, I curated a community because of my fascination, right? As a lot of people want, like, huge businesses. That's never been something I cared about. Uh, but... I wanted to get fit, and so I got a bunch of athletes in the community, and I got to work out with some Navy SEAL buddies and, like, all that, and that's what got me back into fitness. And now I work out, like, five times a week, give or take. Nice. Uh, and uh, I, I got myself completely out of debt by developing good habits. I, you know, get to go to the Emmys every year, which is kind of crazy because I'm probably the only behavioral scientist at it. I get to go to the Grammy. Like, you know, I, I'm wow, often pulled cool. into these kind of wild um, scenarios. I've written two books, and that wasn't predictable at all. I'm dyslexic. Uh, and I, what I think the most interesting thing is that anytime I'm, I need something, like expertise or knowledge, I can actually go to somebody who's probably among the world experts on it. That's so, incredible. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody and they're like, oh, you know, telomeres, those little, you know, the tips of your genetics that that come off like the plastics on the sh your your laces. And somebody was talking about that. And I was like, oh, I'm not really sure if what you're saying is that accurate. Let me just ask somebody. And I reached out or I was able to reach out to the woman who won the Nobel Prize for it. And she's like, oh, no, that's not really that accurate. Uh, you know, longer telomeres doesn't actually necessarily make you live longer. It, if you have really short ones, that probably suggests you're, you're not going to live that long, though. So it's, it's kind of crazy to be able to, like, <laughs> get the answer from the person when I need it. So I'm curious, though, because when, when we look at social connections, you know, it, you've, you've, you've been able to get yourself out of debt. You have become fitter. Than you, I'm going to suggest maybe than you've maybe ever been or got back into being as fit as what you've been before. You've now got access to incredible amounts and vast knowledge and networks that give you access mm -hmm. to other levels of socialization. What has it done for your well-being, though? Because, you know, we often talk about in positive psychology, the, you know, the happiness principle and how mm. many people are often chasing things, social connections, getting out of debt, you know, being invited to the fancy party in order to then be choosing to be happy. How has this affected your well-being? So there's a, a few things. One is that I don't say yes to money. 
I don't say no to it, but it's not, uh, it's not the focus. So I try to live my life based on the research. And I've reached a point where I don't have to worry about my next meal, which is like, or my rent, right? So I've enough saved up that I don't have to worry about that. And as a byproduct, uh, when me and my wife make decisions about our finances, uh, they're not based in any concerns. So we say stuff like, okay, we need to deal with this issue. Uh, is this an issue we can throw money at? Like, is this something that we could just have the privilege of not dealing with and paying somebody even if it costs a lot of money? And so I, I look at money as a utility really to like not to worry and to enjoy the things I want to and not in the pursuit of it. What I really look at instead is, um, is engagement. So when you actually ask people, are you happy? Or you ask somebody who starts a new job, are they enjoying themselves? They generally say, or they'll often say, yeah, I'm really learning a lot. And it points to this interesting characteristic. Human beings are most engaged when they're doing something just slightly outside of their skill set. Mm. If it's too hard, they feel like they're failing constantly. And if it's too easy, it's boring, right? You feel stagnant. So instead of pursuing money as the main goal of my work, I look at engagement. Because if I got paid double, it wouldn't have any effect on my life. I don't have a desire for crazy cars or whatever it is. I don't need to fly private or something like that. Um, what I do want, though, is to wake up and find the work that I'm doing interesting. And so when we talk about happiness, most of the time we're probably talking about engagement, mm. like feeling like we're fully involved in our work. And that's how I pick my projects. If I'm worried that I'm going to hate my client, then I just don't sign the contract. <laughs> so you've written, this is your third book that you've got coming out now. The first book uh, you second, wrote, second. Believe, second book. Your first yeah. book was, is it, was it the 2AM principle? Yeah. And it's, um, um, discover the science of adventure. So just before we dive into more about um, your invited, just give me, what's the, 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 the elevator pitch for the 2AM principle? Um, I, I grew up watching a lot of movies like Indiana Jones and me Ferris too. Bueller's Day Off. Oh my God. And I wanted that life. And people are like, that's ridiculous. Nobody, you, you know, that's just, it's all random chance if you have an exciting time doing something. And I was like, no, that, that can't be the case because there's always those people that you talk to who have the most outrageous stories and then people who have like quiet lives. If we could quantify what people do to live those outrageous lives, then we could reproduce that. And that's kind of a theme that you'll notice in my writing in general is that I really don't like stories that don't present reproducible knowledge, right? So I have an immense amount of respect for Bill Gates, for example. But if I were to do exactly what Bill Gates did, I would not be a billionaire. Mm. Because he came at a specific time with a very specific knowledge set and was daring as all. Like he dropped out of a top university to pursue his company, dedicated years and years of time to it. But I could do all of those things and just the timing wouldn't be right. And or my knowledge wouldn't be right, whatever it is. And so I really care about, as a scientist, can these things be reproduced? Mm. And what I found was that every adventurous experience, if you think back to your craziest, wildest, usually night out, but not necessarily, it all followed a predictable four stage process. And each stage had specific characteristics. And when you apply them, life becomes more exciting. And the basic premise of it is that the size of your life is in direct proportion to how uncomfortable you're willing to be. Mm -hmm. Right? The adventure excitement happens at the edge of your comfort zone. And so um, I went around and put a lot of stupid things to the test to come up with crazy stories. Uh, and I frankly almost died a few times, <laughs> like with that bull in Pamplona. Uh, so that's the basic premise of it. Uh, and it seems to hold up pretty well in terms of the and You mentioned there were side. four characteristics. Do you mind covering yeah. those in brief? Oh, no, no, for sure. 
So uh, the first is, uh, I call it the epic model. It's four characteristics. So establish, uh, we put the right elements in place so that we maximize our chances of, of having an adventurous experience. And the most important is the people you're with, right? So if we all have those friends who, are, who prefer quiet times, and then we have those friends who are going to egg us on in a healthy way, and, and those are the people we, we want to be around because you could be with, at the greatest party with a miserable group of people and be miserable, or you could be at a terrible party with the greatest group of people and they'll make it amazing. And so those are the people you want to be with. The second is location. Your brain actually operates differently in new environments. Uh, there's a section of the brain called the SNVTA, and I talk about this often. It's the major novelty center. And it responds relative to how novel something is mm. and entices you to explore and understand. So we actually get pulled out more. We become more curious. We want to engage more when we're in new environments assuming it's not terrifyingly dangerous, right? Like if you're in a war zone, you're probably staying put, but aside from that. Uh, and then if we're in an environment that's super familiar, what helps is to kind of turn into a bit of a game. So to add constraints on it or a mission. So like if you go to the same five bars every weekend because you're in a small town or whatever it is, uh, then you can turn it into a game like, okay, we can only spend $5 the entire night and we have to figure out how to turn it into something fun. So by adding constraints, it forces creativity. And now you're playing a game that's much more entertaining than, oh, I'm going to try and get drunk this weekend. So that's the, the first stage is establish. And the second is that what defines an adventure, as I define it, is that it's an experience that is one, uh, exciting or remarkable. It's worth talking to, or talking about rather, right? The second is, is it possesses adversity and or risk, preferably perceived risk. So you can experience fear and excitement with a perceived risk like bungee jumping. It's very safe. You don't have to almost get yourself killed like I did running with the bulls. That's actual peril. And the third is that it brings about growth. The person you are at the end is distinct from the person who started. If there's no growth, then I would say it wasn't a real adventure. Mm. And so this, the P, the push boundaries, you have to cross some kind of social, physical, or emotional boundary. That might mean talking your way into a party that you're not supposed to be at. It might mean climbing a mountain that's really hard and really pushes you. It might mean uh, going to talk to people when you're scared, right? That whatever it is, you wanna cross that boundary. So it's established push boundaries increase, which is that you maximize the emotional value from the environment that you're in. So whatever there is to do there that would give you the most enjoyment or interaction. And then the C is continue. And you want to look at a few characteristics to figure out if you should go somewhere else or stay where you are. And if you do go somewhere else, uh, there's also a the belief that, or this is my belief, uh, the 2 a.m. principle is that nothing good happens after 2 a.m. except the most epic experiences of your life. <laughs> Meaning, you're either like stuck at four o'clock in the morning eating pizza with your friends asking where the single people are, or you're in a dance off with Usher, but there's really nothing in between. It's either like incredibly amazing or you should have just gone home after 2 a.m. Uh, so the key is in calling it. And if you're gonna call it, what's essential is that you end in style. And here's why. Uh, have you ever heard of the peak end rule? Has, it, has this ever come oh, up? Oh, peak end rule. Um, no, but I, I think I have under, I understand vaguely the, the principle, which is you end on, you end before you enter diminishing returns. So essentially, that it's that the brain actually doesn't process the length of pleasure or pain. What we remember are the peaks of experiences and how they end. Mm. So it's not like we average moment by moment. Like if you go to Disneyland. If you were actually average moment by moment, you're pretty miserable most of the time. But in retrospect, because the peaks are so great and because the ending is amazing, then you remember it more positively. So the key is to end an experience not by letting things peter out to nothingness, but to let them end on a high note and then going home. 
Mm. And the reason is that by ending on a high note, you're more likely to participate again in the future. And if you let things peter out, you're just going to be exhausted and unhappy the next day. And so you'll remember it more negatively, and you're going to be less likely to actually do exciting and enjoyable things. And so oh. my general belief is that when you do choose to end things, you end in style. Otherwise, you continue and loop through the process over and over again. So, so enter, yeah. enter you're invited. So I'm going to assume the genesis of this book came about based on the research, not just the research that you've studied, but also the research you've done yourself. Have you identified that there is a framework to this socialization, the concept of being able to put yourself? Because a lot of people say, Cohen, I would love to be able to put myself in a room with an Olympic athlete. I'd love mm -hmm. to be able to put myself in a room with a you know, with an Elon Musk or, um, you know, or a Navy SEAL or, you know, some kind of um, value-based equivalent. So have you identified the, that there is a process to... to, to, to oh, for to, sure. Yeah, let's get into that. Uh, I'd love to. And I do want to point out two or three things. Uh, one is that Olympic medalists are incredible heroes for their countries. They dedicated an immense amount of time to... Uh, their mission of representing their country uh, at the highest levels of sports and athletics. Here's what's incredible and kind of upsetting. They're mostly forgotten. And so if you actually want to hang out with Olympic athletes, it's, if you're willing to do a bit of research, uh, they're pretty easy to get a hold of. And I believe that they deserve much more attention and much more respect for their, uh, for their dedication to, for what they've done. And so in general, people are much easier to get a hold of than we think. The problem is that we get a little myopic, right? So when I ask people, who do you want to meet? They always say Elon Musk. And I'm like, listen, the guy works crazy hours. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to get from the experience what you want. You're probably better off meeting like the head of Solar City or the head of, mm. you know, Tesla or the head of like his subsidiaries, because they're probably pretty trained in his approach and they'll want to hang out with you more. Uh, the people like Elon Musk, Sir Richard Branson, Oprah, like their lives are full. These are, let's call them global influencers. Mm -hmm. I'm all for knowing them. That's great. I just don't know if you're going to be able to be friends with them. So if you want a selfie, go for it, right? Go buy a ticket for a nonprofit gala, see them for a second, take a photo. Wonderful. If you really want to have friendships, then there's a system for approaching that. Um, so I think the first thing is, uh, in the book, I describe something called the influence equation. And my theory is, and people might come up with different theories, is that our influence is a byproduct of who we're connected to, how much they trust us. And the third is the sense of community that we share. And so we've kind of covered the trust portion, right? We talked about the Ikea effect and vulnerability loops and all this stuff. So, but the question is then like, how do you connect with people? So let me ask you a question. If you got a random email from somebody, what would have you accept an invitation to connect with them? For me personally, it would probably be mm -hmm. some form of shared values some form of shared meaningful values in, in the way that I could either, um, there was a, an incredible alignment in interests or purpose. Mm -hmm. Great. So we, what you're pointing to is, let's call it like a background of relatedness. In the sciences, it actually has a terrible term. It's called multiplexic relationships. And it works like this, which is if we shopped at the same bookstore and shopped at, went to the same gym, we'd be more likely to be friends because we have two things in common, right? Mm. So the more commonalities you have with a person or more common ground, the more likely you are to connect with somebody. But if that's not an option, like if I have no background of relatedness with you, then what am I going to do? And so my options are kind of limited. One is, uh, and I would say we have to start with this. We have to acknowledge that you, everybody wants your steam. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Everybody wants your social clout because being around you gives them status. They want your time and they think your time is spent in a really sexy way because they see the guests that you talk to and the activities that you're up to. Do you have any kids? 
I have um, one, one, I have two. One, one's mine, one's my partner's. All right. Seven and nine. So, uh, and so they don't realize that like half of your time is spent like running around after kids, making sure that things aren't going crazy in the house. They want your expertise to grow their business or whatever it is, their ac your access and your money, either through donations or mm. funding or whatever it is. So everybody's after something. So what do we do about that? Well, the first thing I say is that we need to be generous. We need to give without any expectation of anything in return. But I'm not talking about generosity like giving you gifts. We talked about that uh, earlier. I mean, generous with opportunity. Because especially when I was 28 and had nothing, I couldn't offer you anything you'd really want other than maybe the potential of meeting other people or doing something interesting. And so the first thing is doing something generous. And if you look at research, did you ever read uh, Give and Take by Adam Grant? He's brilliant. No. Uh, it's um, essentially looked at givers, people who are generous, takers, those who are selfish, and matchers, those that mimic behavior. And he asked, who are the most and least successful? Are they givers, takers, or matchers? And what he found was the least successful were the givers. Hmm. Which one are the most successful? I'm going to say one in the middle. Uh, the givers, matchers? The matchers. Uh, uh, it's actually the givers. So the givers are both the most successful and the least successful. Oh, wow. Okay, because mm -hmm. when you said least successful, I was like, that kind of stumped me because I would have assumed based on the law of you know, fair exchange, people who give by virtue would attract a lot more. Mm -hmm. So mm. what he found was that those that don't know where to draw the line mm. give too much and then costing them their own success. So if I give you all of my leads, I'm going to fail. Yeah. If I help you study for a test and don't make sure that I study what I need to, I'll fail. Mm. But if I help you out and then I go also take care of the stuff that I need to, then I'm in a much better situation. And so the, the key here is to be generous, but know where to draw the line. And the reason that generosity is so important, first of all, if you're going to trust me, I need to be benevolent. You need to see that I have your best interest at heart, that I'm honest and that I'm competent. I can follow through with what I, I'm offering you. The second thing we talked about already is novelty. Somebody who's successful has experienced it all. They don't need another casino themed fundraiser and they sure as hell don't need a free cup of coffee <laughs> for your advice, right? So what will attract them are things that stand out as different. It'll literally pull them out and get them to want to connect. It'll get their attention. So when I designed the influencers dinner, I designed a format nobody had ever heard of. Nobody could talk about their work give their last name, they cook dinner together, and when they sit around the table, they play a game to guess what everybody does. <laughs> and then they find out that it's, you know, the president of MTV and the editor-in-chief of Elle and a Nobel laureate and an Olympian and so on. I've hosted over 2,000 guests at 227 dinners in 10 cities in three countries. Wow. Now, the third characteristic is that you want it to be well curated, meaning that highly influential people, everybody thinks, if I were to ask you, oh, who do they spend their time with? You'd probably be like other influential people. But who do you spend most of your time with, Kerwin? My family. <laughs> now, and when you were probably working and traveling, then it would have been like your admin. Yeah. You, right? Yeah. Well, actually, fair enough. If I'm really honest, it's not actually my family. The most, pe the most people I spend the most time with are my team. Yeah, yeah. It's, but in terms of quality, yeah, I get it. And so if I curate a highly, uh, sorry, if I have a highly curated environment, people will spend a fortune to go there. So think about Davos, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody goes to Davos just for the talks. It costs $250,000 plus to attend. They go there because of the chance of bumping into Bill Gates in the snow and freezing their butts off. And so... Or TED is like 10 grand US. So if I can curate an environment with other influential people, then others will flock to it and go far out of their way. And so uh, there's one other characteristic, which is arguably if you could trigger awe or wonder, 
that would be, it's arguably the most desired human emotion, right? This experience of suddenly seeing the world in a new way. Uh, it's very, very rare and near impossible to accomplish, but we get it to happen every so often. And what I really like about it is that it causes people to feel more generous and more connected. And so as a byproduct, um, it leads to stronger social ties. So when it comes to connection, especially with highly influential people, I try to do something generous, novel, well curated, and maybe something that triggers our wonder. For me, that mm. became a dinner. For you, that might be something completely different. Now, I do want to point out something very specific. When I started this, I had no relationships like these, right? I was not famous, I, the son of immigrants. Like, it's not the world I grew up in. And so I needed to figure out a way to, to level up, and that's exactly what I did. My first dinners weren't that impressive, but by the fifth, sixth, seventh, I kept getting recommendations and figuring out how to research people. And now I have a full research team that just finds me interesting people. Mm. And so uh, I'll be honest, even with all the articles and the reputation, I think we invite like 220 people to fill a 12 person dinner. Wow. So you're running. And that's numbers. because uh, it's, oh, we're tracking. Yeah. We don't treat yeah. it as numbers. We're not like, well, no, we treat no it. but I, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a game of, it's a, it's a game of statistics. Cause you, if you invite 12 people, one might be able to come. Whereas if you're mm -hmm. inviting 220 people, you know, there's an average that you'll end up with, you know, let's, I would assume, you know, 10 to 12 people that would be able to come. Yeah. And, but they're and meaningful numbers. Because I don't want your guests to sound like a, just a mere number or yes. statistic. <laughs> so the, the fact is we just had to be really respectful that their schedules are insane, right? Mm. So when you're inviting the president of Pepsi, like the person lives on a plane, like the chances that they'll be in the same city as you is near zero and on a night where they don't need to be with their family or care for their dog or whatever it is, right? So it's... Um, yeah, it, it's been a really interesting journey. I think the biggest thing is that uh, whatever it is that you do to want to connect with people, uh, the key is to do it really authentic to you. Mm. Because if I didn't like that experience by the fifth time, I would like I would just wouldn't continue. So that might mean that for you, you might want to start a run club that has like a kind of funny characteristic or a knitting circle or a hike or whatever it is that something that you really enjoy and that you would want to do time after time what to say develop happens, consistency. i really do love to cook and i'm fucking great at it so you're giving me some great ideas and it's as i said earlier it's timely because i'm someone that i am ambiverted but i'm massively socially introverted but i'm starting mm -hmm. to realize <clears throat> for my own well-being for my own you know uh, neurological well-being and um, brain you know brain health moving forward i need to start you know creating and investing in more meaningful connections and yeah you've actually inspired me in many ways because i've been looking at okay i know i need to socialize more but how what does that look like you know because networking mm -hmm. to me as i said it's like you know oh, it's um, the worst it's yeah it's like uh it's not fun for me or most people but this is something i could really wrap my head around and i think this is something that a lot of people could wrap their head around you know, because it is something that is quite social. It is something that is quite fun. And, you know, dinner is one of those things that everybody has to have it. And so the likelihood of people being able to show up, you know, there's a there's a variant in, in probability of, of, of success there. So in the book, you're invited. Like, do you essentially so show people how a, you put it together? No, no. So one of the things I say is that you don't want to uh, do somebody else's idea, right? right. The dinner gotcha. is really my thing. Your thing, and, yeah. Yeah. And the reason I say that is that you don't want to be a – a second rate copycat of something, right? Like yeah. I, we were already in three countries, 10 cities, thousands of people who've attended. You want that thing that's your signature. Mm -hmm. Now you might love food. And so it might be, you can come up with another themed food experience, gotcha. but then it's yours and it lives and breathes with your values. Yeah. And that's, what's critical. It could also be, and this is, might sound like a completely ridiculous thing. Uh, it could be, Painting food. It could be like, you know, it could be, you know, it might be amazing for you, Kerwin. If you really want to connect with people, there's a group that did this in San Francisco, the Silicon Valley crowd. And they would 
take over the stadiums of universities and just the pitches, like the play space where they would play. And then they would have people bring their kids and they would have like soccer clubs and then the parents could hang out together. Wow. And that kind of stuff is awesome. Mm. If you have kids, it then allows you to be doing something wonderful parenting wise, allowing to congregate your friend, your kids' friends, integrate you further into the community and hang out with, and in this case, it was deal flow that they cared about. So they brought the top investors together. But then as like an extra thrill, they brought professional soccer players to come and teach the kids. And, mm. and for investors that were normally spending, you know, 100,000 for an event, getting, you know, paying 20 That's grand or whatever for a bunch of professional athletes is like super cheap. John, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and as I said, from the moment I met you, I liked you, which uh, speaks volumes for your work. Your book, You're Invited, uh, Cultivating the, the Art and Science of Cultivating Influence, it comes out in May. Where can people find out more about this book? Maybe pre-book it, pre-buy it, get on the oh, list? Oh, it's literally everywhere. I mean, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles. I don't know where in, uh, in other parts of the world, but I'm pretty sure it's available around you. What's the big uh, bookseller in your area? Uh, we've got, gosh, what have we got? D Dimix, uh, Booktopia. Um, yeah, they're, they're dying. They're dying off a very horrible death <laughs> over here. So most everyone can get access to Amazon though. And mate, I would love it if at any point in the future you brought this, um, this dinner to Australia. I'd love to be a part of it. I'd love to support. So I'm, I'm count me in. Here's what we can do, Kerwin. Uh, you pick a date far enough in the future where the weather is going to be really nice. Which city are you in? I'm in Byron Bay. Bi wow, okay. So I'm assuming we'd have to do it in, like to get the most influential people in your culture, we'd need to do it in- Either Sydney or the Gold Coast or Brisbane. Yeah. So um, let's plan it. What we should do is check in in like six months, see how many yeah. people are vaccinated and how open the country is. <laughs> and I'd love to come. I mean, I'd need like, three, four days to adjust to the time zone. Yeah, but yeah. It's, I would absolutely love to do like an annual Australian dinner. Oh That'd man, be... I'd love to be a part of it and support you in the process. And mate, where can people find you on social media? Because I'm going to assume you not only I'm... write about interesting things, you say interesting things on other platforms. I've, I've said an interesting thing or two. Uh, my social handles are all the same. I'm yeah. at John Levy, T-L-B, J-O-N-L-E-V-Y. T like Thomas, L like Lion, B like Boy. And I'm at John Levy T L B everywhere. I now also am hosting a ton of clubhouse room. We'll yeah, see if nice. this ages well, if in like two years somebody listens to this and <laughs> they're like, what's clubhouse? Yeah, I heard right. about this thing. Well, clubhouse would be a great um, iteration of what it is that you're doing. So that's actually really quite smart. Yeah, I like that. So it's, uh, you know, I've been hosting digital events, like a whole lot of them. Uh, are you, you, this is your morning, right? Correct. Okay, so we're going to get you an invite for uh, your morning next weekend. We're going to, for like a super fun digital event. All right? Done. Okay, cool. Fantastic. This is going to be great. You're going to love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is John Levy on the podcast. We'll have all the links below for you to be able to go and get your hands on his latest book, You're Invited, The Art and Science of Cultivating Influence, which is set to be released in May 2021. John, thank you so much for being on the show. Kerwin, you're a masterful interviewer and a delight and so charming. And I'm only disappointed that I don't get to have you in my city so we can hang out and you could positively influence me. So Bless thank your you cotton for having socks. Me you're a lovely man. And the fact that you remind me of my father-in-law who I adore <laughs> is just this extra added bonus. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Unstoppable. John Levy, check it out. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning 
and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly. So if you'd like to find out more information, KerwinRay.com.